is the kind of neighbor that will take legal action against you if you paint your door off white when all doors in the neighborhood are white or is the kind of person that will call a neighborhood meeting to complain about the fact that you decided to plant white roses in your garden when all the other gardens in the neighborhood have red roses hello i'm stacy and welcome to the channel I am back with another book review and these videos always bring me so much excitement because they provide tangible proof of progress. Starting something new, there's always that strong desire to do really well in that area, especially if you're passionate about it. In my case, even though I'm not an avid reader, my goal this year is to become one. While I haven't fully achieved that yet, I'm learning that there's so much joy to be found in the journey as opposed to solely focusing on reading a high number of books. I've come across some truly delightful books and some that didn't quite hit the mark. But with every day that I read, even if it's just one page, one chapter, or an entire book, each completed story brings a wonderful sense of gratification. So today I have five books to share with you guys, but before we get into it, I should mention that this is not a spoiler-free video. So if you watch this video, get ready to be spoiled, but just here and there, not that much. Now that that is out of the way, book number one. The first book is really good actually, written by Monica Hazy, a Canadian writer, screenwriter, and comedian. This book is about 384 pages and it's set in Canada, specifically downtown Toronto. The story revolves around our main character Maggie and she has been in a committed relationship with John since she was 19. After 9 years together, including a 2 year marriage, Maggie and John realize that their relationship is not working out as they thought it would be. Maggie takes initiative to address their issues and their mutual agreement on their relationship's failure leads them to opt for divorce. This significant life shift pulls Maggie into a new journey where she's a young divorcee and she struggles with redefining her life. I was initially drawn to this book because of its cover, but beyond that, I found it to be very exhausting to read. This story is solely told from Maggie's perspective, which means we're limited to a story told through Maggie's thoughts her perception of people and her interpretation of situations. Because we're finding Maggie when her life is in shambles, she honestly becomes such an insufferable character. Her decisions are often unhealthy and sometimes even bordering illegal, especially when it comes to how she's handling her divorce. She refuses to seek help even though she needs it and she maintains a self-defeating and self-loathing attitude throughout the book. Her situation sounds like one where you would have a lot of empathy for the character. While I initially felt empathy, as the book progressed, it became an uphill battle to read about a character that knows they need help but constantly refuses to get any help, decides to remain miserable and make everyone around her miserable. Admittedly, the book did begin really well with lots of gripping text. For example, the opening part goes something like this. My marriage ended because I was cruel, or because I ate in bed, or because he liked electronic music and difficult films about men in nature, or because I did not, or because I was anxious and this made me controlling, or because red wine makes me critical, or because hunger, stress, and white wine make me critical too, or because I was clingy at parties. Or because he smoked weed every day and I did not think it was actually the same thing as my drinking two cups of coffee in the morning. Or because I'd stopped imagining what our children might look like. Or because he never started. Or because when we were first getting together, I'd kiss someone else and sometimes still thought about her. This morning after he left, I'd almost immediately taken a photo of myself wanting to preserve the moment. If I'm being honest, in the beginning, I was really hooked to this book. I liked the style of writing, it was intriguing, and I was curious to see how the story was going to progress. My general thoughts are this is a well-crafted book that depicts an outlook that some individuals might fully resonate with, or perhaps find certain aspects that they can connect to. I'll go as far as saying that you might recognize reflections of your past self in some instances or fleeting moments. I know I did. Personally, while not everything directly mirrored my experiences, I could see Maggie's attitude reflected in moments of my past self. I think anyone reading this book will find certain moments where they can see a reflection of themselves because living life you can't always be like a positive beam of sunshine. 
But I think what this book does really well and constantly is depicting the ugliness that can come out of a person when you're experiencing something really difficult like divorce. And our girl Maggie here, she's a mess and she just makes the worst decisions over and over again. The main issue with this book is that Maggie is a constant presence that is a perpetual embodiment of pessimism. She's like that one friend you start avoiding in real life because their negativity is draining and it seems like in a fictional book you also want to avoid her too. Initially, Maggie's friends are supportive, offering help to get her back on her feet. However, she does remain stuck in her self-destructive patterns, causing them to gradually distance themselves. This story is told by Maggie, so when her friends start to distance themselves, you're just left with Maggie and being with Maggie alone is a lot to deal with, even as a reader. You find yourself missing her friends, even though this is just a fictional book. And I think this is where the book falters. Spanning 384 pages, you are left with a character that refuses to evolve in any way, but instead repeats harmful patterns. It quickly becomes repetitive and tiresome. As a reader, I think having a character like Maggie demands a more concise approach. Had the book been written in half the pages, it would have made for a more engaging read. After getting halfway through this book, this book has become my first did not finish book due to its exhausting nature. Each completed story brings a wonderful sense of gratification. I know my intro was all about progress and finishing books, but sometimes the best thing you can do is not finish a book. Just put it down and move on to the next one. I remember reading this and being lost in the repressive narrative of Maggie's behavior, but then all of a sudden Maggie makes a phone call to her husband and now we have somebody else come in. It's not just Maggie and everything that she has to say. And for that moment, I was so excited. I was so curious to see how everything was gonna pan out. And then the phone call ended and then we were back to just being with Maggie alone and that is when I realized I am bored out of my mind reading this book. Part of me does think this is like a testament to how well crafted Maggie as a character is but continuing to read this book felt like torture. I don't know how Maggie's story ends but I do hope she evolves as a character and finds her footing in life. I also wonder if there's anyone out there who has come across this book, read it and actually finished it. After I decided to put this book down, I found out that it aims to be humorous and that was surprising because I think I laughed once or twice. But it is possible that a Canadian audience might find more humor in this book. Next up is a man called Ovi or maybe Ov or Uva or Uve or Uv. I've heard people say it in so many different ways. So honestly, I'm not sure what the accurate pronunciation is. But the entire time I was reading this book, I read it as Ovi. So let's run with that. This novel is written by a Swedish author named Frederick Bachman. It set in Sweden and it spans around 337 pages. A Man Called Ovi is about this elderly man with an intensely grumpy exterior. He comes across as very unfriendly and he generally keeps to himself. Ovi Aritad Waka resides in what seems to be a gated community. He is a solitary man who was born before the technology boom. In a world dominated by the internet, computers and automation, Ovi longs for the days where manual work was the norm. His structural and methodical nature, evident in his working years, continues on to his daily retirement life. Every day, he diligently wakes up at a specific time and follows a specific routine. At first, Ovi's crankiness might lead you to dismiss him as a grumpy old man, but as the story unfolds, we realize there's a deep and touching human life beneath that exterior. We get to see this through a chatty young couple and their energetic daughters who move in next door to Ovi. Despite his unfriendliness, they persistently insert themselves into his life. Through this, we learn that when you quickly label someone, in Ovi's case, a grumpy old man, you miss out on seeing this person as a human first and foremost, and also seeing this person as someone with a story worth knowing. What I appreciated about this book is the portrayal of positivity and good nature in an unconventional manner. Ovi in a way can be compared to someone like 
Chef Ramsey who can easily upset people. However, spending time with Olvi, you begin to see the pattern in his actions and you end up realizing there's so much kindness in everything that he does. Initially, I admit I was annoyed with Olvi's character. He is the kind of neighbor that will take legal action against you if you paint your door off white when all doors in the neighborhood are white. Or he's the kind of person that will call a neighborhood meeting to complain about the fact that you decided to plant white roses in your garden when all the other gardens in the neighborhood have red roses. Being retired, it's easy to think that Ovi has so much free time on his hands and he doesn't know what to do with it, so it's necessary to be that petty. Yet I figured when you find yourself shutting off a story because it doesn't align with your preferences, that's the time to go back, reread the story and try to have an open mind. So I went back to the beginning and I tried to read this with an open mind. By the time I finished this, I found that I genuinely enjoyed reading the book I enjoyed reading about Ovi's story and I appreciated the fact that Ovi's character never changed because there was nothing wrong with him to begin with. Ovi's story isn't a larger than life story. He's a simple character with a normal human life. But what makes his story worth listening to is just the fact that every human story is worth listening to. This book is very heartwarming and filled with so many great lessons. I think the biggest one is recognizing that good can present itself in a different and non-conventional way. Since I've said it's heartwarming, I should also mention that life is never perfect and even for all the a fictional character, prepare yourself to read about some very heartbreaking moments. With that said, you may also want to look for trigger warnings before reading this book because it does have some dark themes. As a whole, I do think this book is worth reading for anyone really. The next book is Open Water, which is the debut novel of British Ghanaian writer and photographer Caleb Azuma Nelson. The story is set in Southeast London and it's a quick read with approximately 146 pages. For the few pages that it has, this book covers a multitude of themes in such a deep and profound manner, offering a perspective that is not often explored. Open Water revolves around an unnamed protagonist that is a young black photographer. One day he randomly meets this woman and is surprised to realize that he has a strong connection to her. She feels the same way too because after the initial meeting they keep running into each other and with each encounter they have, they get closer. You might call it a love story, perhaps one that is forbidden. This Brief summary may feel like a familiar storyline, but the nuance and uniqueness of the storytelling transforms the reading experience into something that is a far cry from any familiar premise. As a black man, the protagonist carries the weight of that identity while navigating life. This book delves into various themes, with one of them being racism. However, it tackles this issue from a unique angle. While discussions often revolve around aggressive acts of racism, what tends to get less of the limelight is the psychological impact on the individuals, particularly when that person is a black man, as focused in this book. It's hard for me to capture the raw honesty, vulnerability and beauty that the author conveys in this book, but let me try. The story reveals how growing up as a black person involves conforming to certain expectations. Every day you exist in a world where you're uncertain whether you will see the next day or even the next hour. And this isn't because you've done anything wrong, but simply because of your skin color, you are perceived as a threat. So the narrator struggles with understanding his own identity in a world that has been conditioned to view him through a single lens. He faces numerous types of loss, whether it's losing somebody that's dear to him or losing his own sense of self. At the same time, he's found love and we get to see the beginning of this journey. Sadly, this also brings its own set of challenges. The traumas from his life seep into his relationship, revealing how his life experiences as a black man have impacted and continue to impact other areas of his life. This story is told in second person, so it's like getting a glimpse into the narrator's mind. He shares his feelings and also how his experiences have shaped his daily life. This isn't the norm to men, specifically specifically black men to be honest and vulnerable in that manner, so it made for an interesting read. Besides themes of love and racism, the book also explores other themes like music, storytelling through photography, family bonds, friendships, and so much more. I found the author's style to be incredibly beautiful. His writing style reminded me of Ocean Wong's book on Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous. Both of these authors just have a way with their words that pulls you into the story 
and keeps you there till it's over. So far this year, this is one of the best books I have read and without a doubt it deserves a 5 star rating. It's a read that anyone, regardless of their background, would thoroughly enjoy. I highlighted so many sections in this book so I'm gonna read a few of them. You want to tell her there are some things you won't heal from and there is no shame in your heart. You want to tell her that in trying to be honest here, you dug until shovel met bone and you kept going. You want to tell her it hurt. You want to tell her that you have stopped trying to forget that feeling, that anger, that ugly, and instead you have accepted it as part of you. Along with your joy, your beauty, your light. Multiple truths do exist and you do not have to be the sum of your traumas. There is an anger you have. It is cool and blue and unshifting. You wish it was red so it would explode from your very being. Explode and be done with it. But you are too used to cooling this anger, so it remains. And what are you supposed to do with this anger? What are you supposed to do with this feeling? Some of you like to forget. Most of you live in a daily state of delusion because how else is one meant to live? In fear? Some days this anger creates an ache so bad you struggle to move. Some days the anger makes you feel ugly and undeserving of love and deserving of all that comes to you. You know the image is false, but it's all you can see of yourself, this ugliness. And so you hide your whole self away because you haven't worked out how to emerge from your own anger, how to dip into your own peace. Sadia Hartman describes the journey of black people from chattel to men and women and how this new status was a type of freedom if only by name. That the resubordination of those emancipated was only natural, considering the power structures in which this freedom was and continues to operate within. Rendering the black body as a species body, encouraging a blackness which is defined as abject, threatening, servile, dangerous, dependent, irrational, and infectious. Finding yourself being constrained in a way you did not ask for, in a way which could not possibly contain all that you are, all that you could be, could want to be. That is what you are being framed as, a container, a vessel, a body. You have been made a body all those years ago, before your lifetime, before anyone else who is currently in your lifetime, and now you are here. A body, you have been made a body and sometimes this is hard, because you know you are so much more. Sometimes this weight is too heavy. The ache in your chest feels bulbous and stretched. And though you wish it would, the ache will not burst. You are thinking of booking into therapy and explaining that you feel like you are made a body, a vessel, a container, and that you are worried because the days when you believe this are becoming more frequent. You came here to say that you are scared you have long been marked for destruction. Next up we have Before Your Memory Fades. This is a third book from the book series Before the Coffee Gets Cold and it is written by Japanese author Toshikazu Kawaguchi. The story is set in Japan and the book spans around 220 pages. When I read the first book in the series, I was enchanted by the story. I had never come across such a familiar storyline written in such a unique way. It was simple yet deeply touching. As I read the second book, the fascination and intrigue hadn't worn off. However, now that I'm reading the third book, it's like watching a magician perform the same trick countless times. Eventually, the enchanting allure of the trick fades away. All three books in the series follow a similar premise and they've all been structured in the same manner. The core concept of the story remains what if you could travel back in time and have one last conversation with somebody important to you. The book uses a cafe as the means for time travel. And within this particular cafe in Japan, there's a specific seat that allows you to travel back in time or into the future and have one last conversation for a limited amount of time. The first two books establish this cafe as one of a kind, but the third book introduces a second cafe that can have the same effect. 
However, this detail is inconsequential. All three books in the series contain multiple short stories and this particular book has four stories I believe. One story is about a woman who is warned that getting pregnant might endanger her life but she does it anyway. So she chooses to travel into the future to meet the daughter she might never meet in real life. Another story is about two best friends aspiring to be comedians. One of them gets married to a wonderfully supportive woman who faces life's challenges alongside her husband. She always puts on a brave front and encourages her husband and his best friend. This encouragement becomes their anchor when they're close to giving up. They eventually achieve astonishing success as a comedic duo but tragically the person who was their strength passes away before she can experience any of this. Suddenly the success loses its significance to the surviving partner and he begins to lose his grasp on life or so it seems. The last story I'll talk about in this book is one that involves a missed opportunity at finding love between two young friends. Fear and hesitation prevent either of them from crossing that line. Time slips by and before they know it, they are both adults and life has pulled them in completely different directions. The stories were delightful to read and depending on the order in which you read the books, the first one you pick up is bound to deeply engage you in the character's story. The second one might feel the same but by the time you reach the third one, you might feel like it has nothing new to offer. These are written in very simple language which makes them very easy to read so you still get a good reading experience. They would make wonderful gifts, however, I don't think they're the kind of books that you feel compelled to revisit and read the story again. Nevertheless, for a first time read, you'll enjoy them and you might even find yourself shedding a tear or two. My final book is Fun Girl by American author Rainbow Royal. This is a young adult novel spanning around 483 pages. The setting is in the US, specifically at a university in Nebraska called the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Fun Girl follows two twin sisters. No, Fun Girl follows twin sisters who have just turned 18 and this is their first time away from home. They've enrolled into university and they're stepping into their first year as freshmen. Despite their similar appearances, they are quite different. One is outgoing, enjoys socializing and going to parties. The other is an introvert with minimal social skills and predictably likes to stay indoors. The story mainly follows the introverted twin whose name is Kath. But of course, her outgoing sister Ren is also part of the narrative. Kath has a specific interest in writing fan fiction. She started a fan fiction story based on this book series called Simon Snow and it blew up online. The fan fiction she writes feels like a loose retelling of Harry Potter, so anyone who loves the Harry Potter series might find this to be an enjoyable aspect of the story. Apart from her fan fiction, the rest of the story falls into the familiar world of teenage or young adult narratives. It's filled with well-known tropes like opposites attract, the nerdy girl versus the cool boy, and even the complexities of dating your best friend's ex-boyfriend. I'm not a fun girl by any sense of the word. In fact, if you are to ask me about a celebrity that I like and then proceed to ask specific questions, I would be at a loss for answers. So, you could say I'm a laid-back fun girl or a lazy fun girl. But with that being said, I recently got into K-pop, anime, K-dramas, J-dramas, and all the other dramas. And I have to say, some of these fandoms really do highlight what it means to be a fun girl or a fun boy. I've picked up a bit, which is enough to tell that the story depicted here doesn't really capture the essence of a fun girl's life. All we basically have here is a teenage nerdy girl who just started university and in her free time she happens to write some fan fiction that loosely resembles Harry Potter. I came across a note that mentioned that the author took a lot of time to research fan girl culture but it honestly feels like the story was written fast then the title fan girl was attached without truly depicting what it means to be a fun girl. The title is a bit misleading, but the book itself is a pleasant read. It's the kind of book you pick up when you're not in the mood for anything demanding, 
because this book requires minimal brain power for you to be able to follow along with the story and understand what's happening. The narrative flows smoothly, but it doesn't come across as a remarkable storyline. Being a YA book, it would likely resonate more with the younger audiences, but I think even a slightly older audience would like this book. There aren't any major plot lines that will keep you at the edge of your seat wanting to know what's gonna happen next. Instead, it's just a chilled, relaxed story about a nerdy girl in university. Is it worth reading? Yeah, it's an okay book. And that concludes this book review. If I was to assign ratings, here's how I'd rate each book. Really Good Actually by Monica Hazy would get 2 out of 5 stars. It was exhausting to read and even if the main character embodies a draining persona, the story should still keep you interested enough to read till the end. A Man Called Ovi gets 4.5 stars out of 5. I enjoyed reading this story but it falls short out of 5 stars because I've read other books that have made me feel so much more than this book made me feel. So technically this is a very subjective rating. Actually, all the ratings here are very subjective. Open Water is an easy 5 stars. It was such an amazing read like I mentioned. I have nothing critical to say about it. It's just definitely a book that everyone should read once in their life. Before Your Memory Fades gets 3 stars, it was a well-written book. But it was also a book that felt like it didn't necessarily need to be written. Um, it kind of felt like it was a copy-paste of its predecessors. Lastly, Fangirl gets 3 stars. This is another well-written book. Yes, the story doesn't push any boundaries, but that's okay sometimes. Thank you for watching this book review video and if you enjoyed it, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Give this video a thumbs up and leave me a comment below.